All right, uh, welcome back to numerical analysis. Um, let's get this all situated. Uh, so yeah, so we're a few days out from the exam. Uh, the exam is going to be on Tuesday. Um, I forget the specific date. Was it the? It's on Tuesday. Uh, date here. I uh, in any case, um, yeah, it's going to be uh, uh, covering all the stuff we've done on function approximation. So the the function approximation stuff is pretty simple. I cut out all the calculus things that we need to do, like numerical differentiation and numerical integration. And, uh, and we're not worrying about all that stuff about sequences and series and all that other stuff. That was just prologue uh, to set us up for this. So the, the exam itself, it, it only consists of like maybe four lectures. Um, and this is halfway through the class. So it's not going to be as bad as you think. Um, I know I'm getting a lot of people who are nervous about the exam, and it's just because we haven't had it yet. Um, I know an online format is scary and, uh, and because I mean it's harder to contact your professor. Uh, there's a lot less interaction and um, yeah, it's hard on everybody. It's hard on me. I mean like just recording this stuff and putting it together takes hours and hours beyond what it would normally take for a regular class. And honestly, I've been really beaten down this whole time. Just I'm exhausted and we still have half the class to go. So um, but yeah, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna push on and um, and honestly, uh, my, I don't make hard exams. Um, the the exam, I sixty percent of the exam is really just going to come down to implementing a method. So you need to know how to do uh, interpolation with, um, say, Newton's divided differences. Uh, you need to know how to do interpolation using van der Waals matrices. Uh, you need to know how to do interpolation. Uh, you know, um, wait, we had one of them, uh, Lagrange. Uh, you know, interpolating polynomials. But Newton is probably going to be more important than so is Van der Vaughan. Uh, these are all methods of getting at the exact same polynomials. So, um, and then after that, uh, you need to know how to do, take a Taylor series. It's something you learn from calculus too. Uh, so if you are given a function, can you give me like the fifth Taylor polynomial out of it? Right. So the numerical routines, straightforward. We should all be able to uh, be able to do those. Um, it just comes down to doing some practice and sitting down with some numbers, um, but overall, not bad. The next thing that we need to worry about are the theorems. There are a couple of theorems I want you to know, um, mainly around the uh, uh, the remainder theorems and things like that. I put an announcement in the uh, um, in, in, like a, a week ago, so just so you guys have a heads up as to the sort of things I want you to review and go down, sit down and practice. If you're having trouble understanding the theorems, sit down and try them over and over again. Um, there's other aspects to the theorems. I can't ask you to prove the whole thing all at once, but I might ask you to prove little segments. Um, something like, uh, you know, proving that uh, if you have a function with n zeros, then the derivative has n minus one zeros, and the second derivative has n minus two zeros, and et cetera, it, distinct zeros. Uh, and that was core to uh, getting the remainder theorem for um, interpolating polynomials. Um, there's also things like the Cauchy's, uh, uh, Cauchy's uh, iterated integral formula, um, which really came down to being a calculus, three things of exchange of variables and using a little bit of induction. Um, there's other theorems that have shown up, uh, and um, I might ask you to assume those other things I just mentioned uh, to go ahead and prove uh, another aspect of the theorem. Um, so, uh, but asking you to do the entire thing all in the exam, that's a bit much. Uh, so uh, just make sure you know a general outline of these theorems and, and make sure you know how to, to go through them if you're asked to. Uh, but that's only going to be maybe like one question uh, on the exam. And the rest comes from the homework. Um, you know, things that you've already seen. And, uh, and what I'm going to give you the rest of this lecture is going to be is just going through homeworks two and three, and I've already given you a video for homework one. Um, and so that involves how to find remainders, uh, using the remainder theorems, how to get uh, tight bounds, uh, and, um, and yeah. I am not expecting you to do any intricate calculations. I, I am just, uh, I am not any of these things like what is the uh, you know, minimum uh, degree that you need in order to get uh, you know, this type of a bound, uh, because that is going to involve uh, you know, taking really, really high order to, uh, derivatives, uh, doing a lot of hand calculations. I don't want you to use a calculator on the exam. And so um, you're not, you don't have MATLAB available to you on the exam. The exam is mainly theoretical. Um, so 
so yeah, uh, so everything you do, you can do by hand. Uh, if you know the algorithms, that's 60% of the way. Um, you know, maybe another 10, 20% is coming from the theorems that, you know, well, I've already given you a list of things to go and practice. And, uh, and then the rest is the homework. And so it's not, it's not too bad. Um, I'm not out to get you. Uh, I'm, I tend to give a lot of partial credit. Um, I can't make guarantees of how much partial credit is going to be worth, uh, and at least until I start going through the, uh, the exams. But I don't want you freaking out. I mean, exams make everybody nervous, and we're halfway through the semester, and this is our first exam. It seems like a lot, but it's really not. Um, okay, so that said, um, why don't we go ahead and start talking about the homeworks, and uh, I'm going to go through most of homework two and three. There's a few problems I'll leave out, and, uh, and I'll tell you about them as we go, and, uh, and we'll break out and do a little MATLAB session later. Uh, okay, so uh, here I'm going to stop, and, uh, and we're going to go back to uh, the little whiteboard session. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, what we're going to start with is the interpolation homework. This is homework two uh, from the class. And uh, yeah, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, take a look at this first question. Uh, using Newton's uh, divided differences to compute an approximation of f of x uh, equals square root of x using uh, two different sets of points. But one set of points is actually going to be a subset of the other. So uh, if we take a look here, so I, I'm saying, uh, so we want to interpolate uh, f of x is equal to square root of x uh, at the points. And so uh, initially, it is just at the points uh, 1, 1. Remember, square root of 1 is 1. Uh, 4, 2. Square root of four is two and uh, nine three, right? And so this is the first collection of points, and so this is going to be interpolated with a quadratic polynomial uh, because it's three points. So, so there we go. Uh, so this is part one, uh, and at part two, uh, it's the same set. Uh, so if I just call it set X, and then we're going to add one other point, uh, the point zero zero, and uh, ultimately what they want us to do, uh, well, I asked you to do. Uh, is I asked you to interpolate, um, you use these interpolants to approximate square root of five, which is sort of what you would use uh, interpolation for. You have a whole bunch of known values, and um, and then of a function, and then you use uh, those known values to make an approximation, and then you can use that approximation to sort of stand in for the function at other points inside uh, the interval. So here, uh, we don't know how to compute a nice formula for uh, a, a nice closed form for say square root of five. Although we could use Heron's formula if we wanted, um, and so, uh, but we do know square root of one. We know square root of four and square root of nine. In fact, we even know square root of zero. So we can use those points in order to give us sort of uh, a guess at what square root of five is. So, uh, so why don't we go ahead and take a look at this? So um, as the suggestion was to use. Uh, Newton's divided differences. Now, the reason why you want to use divided differences is because uh, basically, if we come up with an interpolating polynomial for these points, and then later we want to add one more point, uh, the divided differences algorithm allows you to use all the computations you already did up here, and then just add an extra one for this guy. And so, um, so yeah, so it, it's really nice uh, because each uh, calculation that you do, uh, you don't have to just throw away. Uh, this is different than what you would do with, say, Lagrange interpolating polynomials, or, um, well, I guess Lagrange interpolating polynomials, you would just put the values uh, at those points, so that's not too bad. But if you're doing, say, an uh, inversion of a Van der Waals matrix, um, it, it is a little bit uh, trickier there. Uh, you have to read, every change has to, uh, affects every coefficient. Okay, so let's do this one. All right, so, uh, so for part one, uh, we have a polynomial of degree two uh, to interpolate three points, right? And um, this is going to be uh, a naught plus a one times x minus one plus a two times x minus one and x minus four, right? Uh, and each of those points came from this, and we don't actually end up using this uh, in the make you know these little polynomials, uh, but it will be used to determine a two. Okay, so uh, why don't we go ahead and start doing that? 
So uh, we just plug in the points, and so P2 at 1 uh, is just going to be A0 because this is 0 and this ends up being 0. And uh, and we already know that that should be 1. So we already have uh, A0. And then we can take a look at P2 at 4, and, uh, and this we already know A0 was 1, and then plus A1 times 4 minus 1, which is 3, uh, plus something, but that's just 0, right? Uh, and this should be equal to 2 uh, from this point here, the y value there. And so uh, putting that all together, we get uh, a1 is equal to uh, 1 third, right? Because we just move the 1 over and we divide by 3. All right. So now we can find that last value, and that comes from p2 at 9. Now we know that should give us three uh, and for, for an interpolating polynomial. And if I go ahead and take a look and I plug in values here, so we have one plus say one third times x minus one plus uh, say a two uh, times nine minus one, which is eight times nine minus four, which is five. Um, and nine goes in here as well. So that actually makes this eight, okay. Uh, so now we just want to solve for a2. Well, uh, it's not too bad. Uh, basically, we get, say, 3 minus 1 minus 8 thirds divided by uh, 8 times 5, which is 40, should be, give us a2. And so uh, just working on that out, it's going to be uh, 2 uh, minus 8 thirds. So it's going to be 6 thirds minus 8, so it's minus 2 thirds divided by 40 and uh yeah so it's going to be minus 2 over 120 which is equal to minus 160. okay so uh so that's it so the the polynomial of degree two uh, that interpolates these points for part one uh is going to be uh one plus one third times x minus one uh minus one sixtieth uh, times x minus 1 times x minus 4, right? So uh, that's not too bad to work out. Okay, so let's do part 2. So part 2 adds on one other thing, and uh, and so it adds on the 0. And so that means now we're going to have a polynomial of degree 3 uh, that's interpolating, and we notice a0 plus a1 times x minus 1 uh, plus a2 times x minus 1 x minus 2 uh, plus a3 times x minus, oh, not x minus 2, x minus 4, times x minus 1 times x minus 4 times x minus 9. Uh, and that 9, because we're doing these three plus another one, uh, we ended up using uh, this x value uh, in our made creation of our polynomials. Um, but something we know already is that a0 is 1, a1 is 1 third, and a2 is minus 1 60th. So that just leaves a3 to find. All right, so uh, what we can do is we can just go ahead and, uh, and plug this in. So we have p3 of x is equal to 1 plus 1 third times x minus 1 minus 1 60th times x minus 1 times x minus 4. And we have plus uh, a3 times x minus 1 x minus 4 uh, times, uh, well, let's just move all this down. Uh, plus a3 times x minus 1, x minus 4, and x minus 9, right? So uh, now we just need to plug in uh, 9, in, or sorry, not 9, <laughs> plug in 0 uh, into this to interpolate that last point that we haven't already. We know that should be equal 0, so p3 of 0 is 0. Um, and uh, now we just need to see what we get on the other side. Well, it's going to be 1 minus one third, putting in zero for x. Um, now out of here, we get negative uh, one times negative four. And so that ends up being um, positive four. And so it's gonna be minus uh, one fifteenth here. And uh, then this last one is plus a three, and it's gonna be negative four times negative nine. And negative four times negative nine is negative uh, 36. Or, sorry, 
positive 4 times negative 9 is negative 36. Okay, uh, we can simplify a little bit more. Uh, so it's going to be, say, 2 thirds minus 1 15th plus a3 times negative 36. And uh, see, it's going to be uh, 10 fifteenths minus 1 15th. So it's going to be uh, 9 fifteenths uh, minus 36 a3. And now if I uh, move minus 9 fifteenths the other side and divide by 36, negative 36. So it's going to be a positive. It gives me a3. Uh, now what does I end up being? Well, 9 goes into 36 uh, four times, and so that is going to be 1 60th. Okay, so what do we get? So uh, we have P3 of X is equal to uh, 1 uh, plus 1 third times X minus 1 minus 1 60th times X minus 1 X minus 4. Uh, and then we get uh, plus 1 60th times x minus 1, x minus 4, and x minus 9. Right, and that is uh, the third degree polynomial that interpolates these points. Right, so uh, this is something I expect you to be able to do on the exam. And, uh, and you know, it only took a couple minutes uh, and we were able to get it worked out. Uh, now, as far as the second part goes, uh, where we want to, or I'm asking which of the two interpolants gives a better estimate for a square root of 5, uh, that's something we actually need a calculator for. Um, and so we can talk about that later. Um, to give it away, uh, it turns out that the uh, this guy gives a better estimate of, um, or sorry, this one, when you evaluate it at 5, gives you a better estimate of square root of 5 than uh, this polynomial when you evaluate it at 5. Uh, and the reason why is that um, all of our, or well, a heuristic reason why, is that um, all of our remainder theorems are actually uh, dependent on us having a bound on our derivative. Um, but the square root of x uh, has a, uh, a derivative f prime of x is equal to, uh, say, 1 over 2 root x. And so we see that actually blows up of 0. So if we, if we interpolate that, that function at 0, it's going to try to also do some huge jump uh, to, uh, to accommodate that uh, vertical asymptote. And so it turns out uh, that it gives very bad approximation when you include that. Uh, but you can get reasonable bounds uh, if you uh, stick to um, uh, an interval away from zero. Okay, so uh, that was the first one. Now let's take a look at the next one. All right, so here there's a little bit of notation that I borrowed from the textbook. Um, and, uh, and basically I'm gonna say, it was this. Um, basically, this is the uh, nth order polynomial uh, that interpolates n plus 1 points uh, of f, and uh, x is the independent variable. So uh, this is so p2 and p3 that we had over here would have been just say p2 f of x f comma x and p3 f comma x, and so this was straight from the uh, the textbook that we've been following uh, that is also listed in the syllabus. Okay, so um, let's see. So uh, they're going to say uh, let p n be the interpolating the interpolation polynomial of degree less than n. Um, less than or equal to n interpolating f of x equals e to the x uh, at the points uh, xi equals i over n uh, with i equaling 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n. So that's n plus 1 points, uh, and it evenly distributes um, uh, across. Uh, so uh, now they're asking us, what is the, you know, find, so this is a remainder theorem problem. So find the maximum between of x between 0 and 1 of e to the x minus uh, p n f x. 
right? Or the interpolating polynomial. Right, so we already know this. Um, there is, uh, this is gonna be less than or equal to uh, the maximum of the n plus first derivative of f, uh, evaluate at some c uh, for c between 0 and 1, and then um, we divide by, say, n plus 1 factorial, and then we have the product of x minus i xi, so it's going to be i over n, and i going from, say, 0 to n here. All right, uh, and that should be an absolute value. So that is our remainder formula, uh, and this wasn't listed in the question, but it is something that you should know by heart by now. Okay, so um, so this is part one, and so let's go ahead and compute that. And they gave us a hint uh, for this one, which is kind of interesting, and uh, we'll end up using the uh, AMGM inequality uh, that we did review back, uh, you know, lecture one, I think, lecture two. So uh, first of all, uh, you know, what is uh, f n plus one of x? Uh, that's really easy to see. Uh, we know actually uh, that um, this is equal to just e to the x. The derivative of e to the x is itself, so not too bad. Um, what is the maximum? Of f n plus 1 of x n? Uh, well, it's an increasing function, and, uh, and it's just going to be e, uh, whatever it is at the right end point. So not too bad either. Uh, so. Uh, so now we've thus reduced it to e over n plus 1 factorial, right? And, uh, and so now they want us to determine a bound on this guy. Okay, uh, so this comes down to, like I said, the AMGM inequality, and they gave us a hint, and they say um, uh, show that I, the maximum between 0 and 1 of uh, the absolute value of x uh, minus i over n times x plus i over n, uh, or n minus i over n minus n minus i over n uh, is less than 1 fourth. And this is actually easier than you think. Um, so remember the AMGM inequality basically says the square root of a times b is less than or equal to the uh, arithmetic mean. So the geometric mean is smaller than the arithmetic mean. And so uh, that means that we have, uh, say, the if we take the square root of this guy, Uh, this is going to be less than the sum, so uh, the average. So x minus i over n plus uh, x minus n minus i over n divided by 2. And I'd, if I had it square root on left, that would be good, but uh, we don't, so we're going to square it. Um, and if you work that out, uh, let's see, the x's become 2x, and uh, it looks like uh, the all that ends up lingering is the n of n. So this ends up being uh, x, because um, this i cancels this i, um, x minus 1 half squared, because it's divided by 2. OK. And so, uh, so then the maximum of x minus one half squared uh, is then going to be uh, well the biggest thing you can have is if it's either at zero or at one and in both those cases uh, it's going to be say one minus one half squared uh, which is equal to one quarter it's just because it's uh, it looks like that right so uh, so good so that's a good first step. And, uh, and here, I should also say we're trying to take the maximum uh, from 0, x less than 1, right, uh, of this quantity. OK, so uh, good first step. Now let's see how we can use it. 
So uh, we have e divided by n plus 1 factorial times the maximum value of 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1 of the product of uh, the absolute value of x minus i over n, i going from, say, 0 to n, right? And, uh, and so basically what we did is we showed that if we take those terms that correspond to sort of symmetric pieces uh, here, so like this guy corresponding to this guy, so it's going to be, say, x minus i over n, and this is going to be, say, x minus n minus i over n. If I take their product, then it's going to be less than 1. Uh, and so there's only one term that could possibly come up that would be a problem, and um, and that would be uh, if we have an odd number of terms where we can't have a, uh, yeah, where we, um, uh, where we don't have a matching uh, guy I didn't make it one quarter. So uh, let, let's go ahead and take a look. So uh, so just to get an idea, um, so if we take, uh, say, um, you know, polynomial of degree one, that would interpolate. And so, so let's just say n is equal to one, for instance. Uh, n is equal to one would give us uh, here, zero and at one, those would be two points there. So then we get e divided by two times uh, one fourth would be a bound, right? Uh, that one quarter comes from x minus zero, and uh, yeah, we'll just be more explicit. Uh, so we have x minus one times x minus zero, right? And um, and then that is less than or equal to uh, in absolute values uh, less than or equal to e over two times four. Uh, so um, equals e over eight. Okay. Now let's take a look at if I had n equals two. Uh, so then that's going to leave me e over 6 times x minus 1 times x minus 1 half times x minus 0, right? Uh, these two guys still give me 1 quarter, and so it's going to be less than or equal to e over 6 times 4 times something. And uh, what is that something? Well, it looks like it's just going to be the largest value of that, and that is going to be 1 half, right? Okay, so uh, now let's do more. So let's say we have uh, n equals 3. Uh, and so it's going to be e divided by, say, um, uh, say well, 4 factorial. So it's going to be 24 times x uh, minus, oh, let's start at 0, uh, times x minus, uh, so n is equal to 3. So it's going to be 1 third. Uh, times x minus two thirds uh, and x minus one. Okay, so the order is kind of screwed up, but whatever. Uh, so uh, these guys each give a quarter and these guys each give a quarter. So that's going to be less than or equal to e over 24 times uh, one over four squared, right? So uh, initially we saw that uh, we have uh, e. Um, e over 8, then we have, uh, and that is really just going to be e over 2 times 4. I guess I already have that written here. So, so it is e divided by 2 times 2 squared. This one ends up being e over 6 times 2 cubed. This one ends up being e over 24 times uh, 2 to the 4, right? So we see in general, and this can be improved by induction. Uh, yeah, so by uh, induction. Um, and you know, that could be left to you guys. Uh, what do we have? We have that uh, e divided by n plus 1 factorial times a maximum of 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1 uh, product of x minus i over n. i equals 1 up to n, or 0 up to n, uh, it's less than or equal to uh, e divided by n plus 1 factorial times 1 over 2 to the n. Okay, so 
I now the rest that we have to do is they said um, you know find the smallest n that gives a bound of 10 to the minus uh, 6 and um, yeah and so basically the idea is that we're just looking for an n that makes that less than 10 to the minus 6 and um, that's just something we can plug into MATLAB and, and have it run um, and so uh, yeah and so and I should say according to this bound This is strictly an upper bound. Um, there's no reason to think that it should be a precise bound. And so um, uh, the the textbook was a little fuzzy on that. And so, um, yeah. In any case, uh, then they're asking us to do the analogous problem with the nth degree Taylor polynomial. And that was actually the sort of thing that's already in your homework as well. Uh, as well. So we won't waste time on that. Uh, we already have done that in the last video. Um, okay. so. Uh, number three, I'm just going to skip over. Uh, no, number three, I'm going to do. Uh, number four, I'm going to skip over. And, uh, but yeah. Um, three uh, is definitely something I, I want you to give a try at. So, uh, what this is coming from, uh, and the, it gives us C of X uh, function in there, which might confuse some of you guys. Um, so, basically, here's the idea is that, um, you know, if you remember for the mean value theorem, you know, basically we have something like this. And um, the mean value theorem says that, you know, if you take a secant line, there is some point between, say, uh, A and B, uh, such that uh, there is a point on the inside here uh, that is going to be tangent to uh, the secant line, but the derivative is going to, but it's actually a tangent line, right? So there's some derivative on the inside that gives you this. See, and this is a strictly existence proof. Um, you know, it doesn't tell you how to find it. And in fact, there might be multiple ones. In fact, there is a, another one like roughly up here. Um, and so, uh, so, but in some cases, uh, that is a unique identification. Uh, so if, uh, as is the case here, that the um, second derivative ends up being invertible, uh, then you can actually go ahead and compute exactly what that C must be. Uh, and so, um, so yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, and see if we can find it, and um, and for each x, uh, you remember the remainder theorem, uh, it gave us uh, a different c. Uh, so um, so the idea is that you know we want to take a look and see what that function is that we end up getting. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look. This ends up being a lot more uh, algorithmic than than you'd expect, and so we're going to say that f of x is equal to one over x, and um, we are interpolating, and consider the interpolant uh, p1 of x uh, that interpolates f at zero and one. Or say one two, right? So I and so given that um, they want us to find this, so uh, find c of x such that we have f of x minus say p one of x uh, is equal to x minus 1 times x minus 0, uh, sorry, x minus 2, i uh, times f double prime of c of x uh, divided by 2. This is a really, really easy problem. So uh, let's go ahead and do it. So first of all, we should figure out what p1 is. Uh, so we can use Newton's divide differences formula 1 if you want, or we can just you know use basic algebra. Um, but let's just use divided differences approach. Um, so this is what we get. Uh, we know that f of 1 is equal to 1 and f of 2 is equal to 1 half. So if I put in p of 1, then that should give me 1. And that is actually also equal to a naught because this term is just 0. 
And then if I put in P2 at two, this should give me one half. And this is gonna give me a one because we figure out what A naught is, plus A1 of uh, say two minus one or just one. Okay, uh, so that's gonna give me uh, A1 is equal to negative one half. Okay, uh, not, not something we needed polynomial interpolation theorems for, but um, yeah, just good practice. So, uh, oh, and that should have been P1 there. Okay, so now we have f of x uh, minus, uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, let's actually go ahead and change color here. So now we have f of x minus uh, one minus one half of x minus one. Just quick check, if I put in two in for here, I get one minus one half, and that gives me one half. So yeah, it does the job. Okay, well good. Now, uh, what is this? This is gonna be uh, one over x minus one minus one half of x minus one, right? And we wanna be able to turn it into something like this. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now factor out um, uh, x minus 1 and x minus 2, and I'm also going to factor out 2. So uh, this should give me uh, 2 times x, or sorry, I'm going to factor out <clears throat> 1 half. So it's going to be x minus 1, x minus 2, uh, divided by 2, and now that we factor that out, we're left with 1 over x times x minus 1, x minus 2, minus, uh, well, this guy on the top, 1 minus 1 half of x minus 1, uh, divided by uh, x minus 1 times x minus 2. And we factor out at 1 half, so we're going to put 2 here, and we're going to put 2 here. And, uh, and yeah, there we go. Okay, uh, so... Um, if you want, you can combine the fractions, so x minus 1 times x minus 2, uh, divide by 2, and um, then what do we get? So uh, I need to multiply and divide by x here, and so now we have, uh, well, 2, uh, let's see, minus 2x, and then we get, um, let's see, plus... Uh, from this minus sign and this minus sign, and it's going to be 2 times 1 half. So that is going to give me a 1, but that's going to be multiplied by x, so it's going to be x squared. And um, you're going to be, and then the last one is going to be, ah, man, this is giving me a headache. 1, 2, 3 negative sign, so it's going to be minus. Uh, x there uh, divided by x times x minus 1 times x minus 2 all right uh, finally uh, we can write this as x minus 1 times x minus 2 divided by 2 and um, we can simplify a little bit we get x squared uh, minus um, minus 3x uh, plus 2 divided by x times x minus 1 times x minus 2 okay good now whatever this is uh, it should be f double prime xc of x so let's see what f double prime is um, f double prime of x, well, we know that the first derivative of 1 over x is going to be um, 1 over x squared times uh, negative 1, right? So, uh, so f prime of x is equal to minus 1 over x squared. And uh, f double prime of x is equal to uh, 2 over x cubed. Okay. So uh, that means that this term over here is equal to 2 over x cubed. So that means that we have 2 over c of x cubed 
is equal to x squared minus 3x plus 2 divided by x times x minus 1 times x minus 2. Okay, so I can now uh, divide by 2, take the reciprocal, and cube root. And that's going to be the way with c of x is equal to uh, 2 times x minus 1 times x minus 2 uh, times x uh, divided by x squared minus 3x plus 2 and uh, and then we have a, a cube and there you go uh, now the rest of the question was asking you to find the maximum on the interval uh, 1 to 2 of c of x and the minimum of between 1 and 2 of c of x and yeah uh, I'll leave that to you guys um, this is just a straight calculus one uh, sort of problem where you just Take a derivative, set it equal to zero, find your extreme values, and you list them out. Uh, it'll be take too long to, to show you guys, but um, but yeah, that's basically that. And don't forget to evaluate the endpoints. Um, I'm actually less concerned if you can find the maximum or minimum of this particular quantity. And so uh, if you want to just plug that into Wolfram Alpha to find out, that's fine with me. Okay, so like I said, I was going to skip over four. Um, two really gave me the, the bulk of what I wanted you guys to, to take away. Uh, from that sort of bound uh, approach. Um, it is an interesting problem that uh, x to the n is less and less linearly independent from x to the n minus 1, and there's a lot of ways you can go about showing it. The way that the author is doing it here is that um, he wants you to get this very specific bound of 2 to the negative uh, n minus 1, uh, but there's a lot of other ways to do it. Uh, Sterling's formula will get you there, um, and, a, and a few other approaches. Uh, if you take the logarithm approach that I showed you in class uh, and the big O notation thing, that would also give you another bound. It won't be quite as tight as what he's asking for, but uh, uh, morally, it gives you the right answer. Um, but yeah, and I guess uh, I'm not going to ask you something that specific on the exam. Um, expect something like uh, what we saw out of two, though. Um, so yeah, so now let's take a look at number five. Um, so uh, number five, uh, it wants you to find a polynomial degree uh, at most three uh, that satisfies the following. Uh, so uh, this is p of one half should give us one, p of zero should give us two. Uh, p prime at zero is equal to one, and p one is equal to two. Uh, and I'm telling you to do a van der Vaughan-like matrix. It's not specifically a van der Vaughan matrix, but the construction of this matrix is very important. Uh, and by the way, this is what is called Hermite interpolation. And what that's coming from is from this derivative here. It's a very easy problem to do. And in fact, uh, exactly this sort of problem I've seen come up as sort of bonus questions out of Calculus 1. So um, but yeah, let's go ahead and uh, take a look. So uh, we're told that we have a polynomial of degree 3. Uh, so p of x is equal to, say, a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3 times x cubed. And we have several constraints we want to meet. Uh, so we want to basically come up with a system of equations that will give us a1 through uh, a3. And it comes from these three points. So for instance, we have p of 1 half is going to be a0 plus a1 times 1 half plus a2 times 1 quarter uh, plus a3 times 1 eighth. Uh, we have uh, p at 0, which will be equal to 2, uh, and that is just going to be a0 plus a1 times 0 plus a2 times 0 plus a3 times 0. And then we get p prime at 0. Uh, so we better figure out what the derivative of this thing is. So let's say p prime of x. It's going to be, uh, well, a0 disappears uh, plus a1 plus uh, a2 times 2x. And then we have 3a3x squared. Okay, uh, so plugging in zero into that is going to give me uh, 
0 plus a1 plus a2 times 0 plus a3 times 0, 2a2 and 3a3 times 0, but all the same. Uh, and I'll just put 0, a, a0. Uh, and so that's good. And uh, the last thing we have is we have that p1 uh, here, and it's going to be a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus a3. Right. And what do all these equal? Well, uh, the first one should be equal to 1, the second one should be equal to 2, uh, the third one should be equal to 1, and the fourth one should be equal to 2. Okay, uh, so I made it so it's really easy to pick out uh, at least two variables here. Um, so here, the only thing that survived was a0, and the second one, the only thing that survived is a1. And so immediately, um, We have uh, a0 is 2, and a1 is 1. OK, uh, so now let's figure out what uh, a2 and a3 are. Uh, so I, if I take a look at, say, the first equation, um, we have that uh, 2 plus uh, 1 half, plugging in a0 and a1, uh, plus a2 times 1 quarter plus a3 times 1 eighth is equal to 1, right? Uh, and so then that tells me that, see, it's going to be uh, three, uh, 4 halves there plus 1 is 5 halves. Uh, so 5 halves, put a2 uh, times 1 quarter times 1 eighth times a3 is equal to 1 minus 5 halves. And so uh, those are going to be. Uh, One is two halves, minus five. That's gonna be minus three halves. And we can clean this up a little bit if I just multiply both sides by eight. And so you're gonna get two a two uh, plus a three is equal to uh, minus 12, right? Okay, so that's one equation. And we can get the second one out of this. So this is here and the second one comes from one of the other terms. Oh, last term uh, p1 is equal to the a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus a3 is equal to 2. And so, uh, so now we have uh, we know what a0 and a1 are, they are 2 and 1 respectively. So we can just put those together. So it's going to be 3 plus a2 plus a3 is equal to 2. And uh, so that tells us that a2 plus a3 is equal to negative 1. All right. So uh, now we just have a system of equations where we have two unknowns. Um, and so that's easy enough to do. Uh, if I subtract uh, this equation from this equation, um, we immediately solve for a2. So we get a2 then must be equal to uh, negative 11. And then uh, if I plug in uh, negative 11 into, uh, the, say, this equation, I get negative 11 plus a3 is equal to negative 1. And so that tells us that a3 is equal to 10. So what is our polynomial? Uh, let's put this in our orange. So we get p of x must be equal to, um, let's see, uh, a0 was 2. So we get 2. a1 was 1, so plus x. Uh, a2 is negative 11, so minus 11 times x squared. And a3 was neg is 10, so plus 10x cubed. And there you go. Uh, so if I plug in 0, for instance, what do I get? I get 2. Uh, and if I take the derivative and I plug in 0, I definitely will get 1. Cause, and, uh, and then the other ones, you can go verify if you'd like. Uh, plug in 1, let's see what happens when I add all these together. I get 2 plus 1. Um, minus 11, so what is that? It's going to be minus 8 plus 10. Uh, is that right? 2 plus 1. <laughs> All right, so 1 minus 11 is negative 10 plus 10. That's 0. So then adding 2 should give me 2. So, and what's that? 2. There you go. All right, cool. So that's three things verified right away. Uh, you can verify the p one half uh, if you like. So uh, not too bad. 
Uh, let's take a look at number six. Um, so, for a quadratic interpolation on equally spaced points, so you're giving us these points x, uh, x1 is equal to x0 plus h, and they're giving us x2 is equal to x0 plus uh, 2h. They want to find an upper bound. on uh, f minus p2 f of you know something and they put this infinity symbol um but they tell us that i uh, just in the next line here they say it, when they write that what they really mean is they mean the maximum uh between x naught and x2 of the absolute value of f of x minus p2 of f of x, right? So, and this is a quantity we've been dealing with this whole time. So nothing really mysterious here. It's just slightly different notation. Uh, and again, this is a polynomial of degree two that interpolates these three points. Um, so we would, we've would we just been calling that p2 of x. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and talk about it. So I uh, want to find an upper bound on this term. Uh, by the way, this is, I. Uh, can be used um, when we talk about numerical derivatives. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look. So we know that this quantity is bounded by f3, uh, the third derivative, at x, um, divided by 3 factorial, and this would be the maximum of f on that interval. Um, and uh, yeah, and this times the absolute value of x uh, not or x minus x naught. Now let's do the project explicitly. x minus x naught, x minus x one, and x minus x two. And really, these should be absolute values. All right. So this is the, the upper bound that we're dealing with. All right, and. Uh, yeah, so we're looking for the maximum here uh, over x between yeah that interval uh, x zero x two and ditto here, so the maximum here. All right, so uh, when I write the maximum uh, between uh, x naught less than or equal to x less than or equal to x two of the absolute value of f third derivative of f of x, uh, this is what the quantity they're talking about f triple prime infinity. That is really horrible handwriting. Okay, so we got that. Okay, uh, now we need to get a bound on this guy. Um, well, we've already seen uh, one way to go about this. Uh, so uh, if I take a look at some sort of like... Yeah, so uh, yeah, let's figure it out. Uh, so here we have these terms. Uh, we have x naught, we have x naught plus h, and we have x naught plus 2h. Uh, and um, so overall, you know, the span of this is uh, 2h wide. Uh, there's a few things we could do. Uh, for instance, I could just say, um, you know, this whole thing is less than h times you know, h times 2h, something like that. Um, but we can use uh, that tech, that trick we saw just a second ago uh, to see if we can come up with something a little bit slicker. Uh, so if I take a look at x naught and times x uh, minus x plus 2h, and uh, I would say not x naught, but Yeah, so uh, rewriting this uh, x minus x naught times x minus x naught plus h times x minus x naught plus 2h. There we go. That's a little clear. Uh, now, if I want, I can, I'm just going to take this guy and I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to try to use the AMGM inequality. So it gives me x minus x naught times x minus x naught plus 2h. Uh, and this is going to be less than or equal to the sum of x minus x naught 
plus x minus uh, x naught plus 2h uh, divided by uh, 2, and we're squaring this because we don't have a square root on the other side. Okay, uh, so what does that give me? Uh, so it's going to give me x here, uh, and then we're going to have uh, minus x naught. It's going to linger around. And um, then we're going to have a plus uh, h. Or, yeah, minus h. Right, because this 2h doesn't have a matching term up here, and so all you're left with is just 2h divided by 2. And this, we're taking a look at that squared. Uh, so, uh, what is this? This is a quadratic polynomial that is centered uh, here. And so, uh, it is going to take its maximum value here and here. And so, um, this we can see. Uh, is less than what it, we get if we plug in, say, an endpoint. So if I plug in x naught, for instance, or x minus 2h, they both give me the same answer, uh, it's going to be less than h squared. Okay, so uh, that means that this entire quantity uh, is less than uh, h squared times x minus x1, uh, and we're taking the maximum over that, uh, but x minus x1 I uh, is x minus x naught plus h, and so uh, it is a linear term that is centered at uh, at this point, and so it's going to take its own maximum value at the endpoints of x naught or x plus two h, and in both cases those are h, so it's less than or equal to h cubed. And there you go. So uh, the max, so the bound that they're asking for is going to be uh, f triple prime uh, the norm the infinity norm of f triple prime divided by say 3 factorial times h cubed and there you go so all right so that is uh homework uh two not too bad okay uh homework three is a little bit straight more straightforward than that uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick So, I. Uh, okay. So, uh, now we're looking at homework three. Uh, number one, I'm going to save uh, for the end because it takes a good amount of time. Um, I won't expect you to do number one, but there's a way, there's a spot about halfway point where I would expect you to be able to do uh, one of the. These proofs, and it was shown in the in the exam and the uh, lecture as well. So, um, but first, why don't we just take a look at number two? Uh, so, we want to give a sketch of uh, say x to the k times one minus x to the n minus k. Uh, and so, uh, then you want to know uh, is it negative over zero one and um, what is the maximum of the function over zero one all right so uh, these are two things that you're going to need to figure out uh, before you even actually sketch it um, so the first one, so we're looking at the, this over just the interval 0 to 1. Uh, outside of that, it isn't really important for our applications. And also, uh, keep in mind that we're talking about uh, n and k uh, you know, being positive integers, uh, where k possibly 0, and, um, and k has to be less than or equal to n. Uh, this all comes to the context of doing this with uh, Bernstein polynomials. Okay, so uh, here, uh, if we take a look, Two things we can figure out right away. When are they zero? Uh, well, zero when you're at x to k, and zero at and uh, sorry here zero when you're zero and you're zero at one. I, uh, you know, if we assume that k is not zero 
and uh, not n, then you're going to be zero here. And you're going to be zero here, right? Uh, if k is equal to zero, uh, then what do we get? Um, k is equal to zero, then we just have one minus x to the n, right? Uh, and so you're going to be uh, you have a zero here, and uh, and yeah, and so it's going to be something like that. And it's going to be a bit one here. Uh, and if k is equal to n, then it goes the other way. Uh, you're zero here and up here, and then you hit one, right? Okay, so uh, so where so we actually kind of figured out the maximum over here already. Um, and is it ever pot? Is it ever negative? No. Uh, and the reason why is between zero and one. That's between zero and one, and between zero and one, that's between one and zero, right? Uh, so it's never negative. Now, uh, how do we find maximum? Uh, well, uh, if I take a look at, I uh, say. Um, Let's just call this f of x. Actually, I think we gave a notation for it a second ago. Uh, so b and k of x uh, is equal to uh, n choose k. Okay, so I'll just stick to f. Um, f of x is equal to x to the k times uh, 1 minus x to the n minus k. All right, now let's take a derivative. All right, so f prime of x is equal to k times x to the k minus 1 times 1 minus x to the n minus k plus n minus k times x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k minus 1, right? Uh, now I can factor out uh, something, I think, can't I? Uh, so we're looking for when this is equal to 0, right? I So I can factor out a whole bunch of terms. So we have 0 is equal to uh, x to the k minus 1 times 1 minus x to the n minus k minus 1. And what does that leave over? It leaves x times 1 minus k times 1 minus x plus n minus k times x, right? And so uh, we know when all these guys are going to be 0, and that's going to be at at this at these endpoints. And so the only thing that's left is uh, figuring out um, that extra zero is going to end up happening, and it's going to happen here. It's going to so that means it's going to be some term point inside the interval. Uh, so I, uh, you know, just doing this over here on the side. Let's make some room. I uh, so we have, yeah. So I made a mistake when I was taking derivative. Uh, I should have put a mole at minus one because we had a chain rule going on here. So I should have been minus here. All right, it makes me feel a lot better. All right. Okay. So, uh, so we get minus there. There we go. Uh, okay. So now if we come back to this, then uh, this ends up being k minus kx. Then we get minus nx plus kx. Kx is cancel. So this gives us k minus nx, which then tells us that x must be equal to k over n. Okay. So uh, that means that if I put k over n here, that's where our maximum is going to be. And uh, so it's going to be something like this. That's what the function looks like. You know, basic sketching rules from from calculus from pre-calculus, really. Um, now what is the value there? Uh, if I go ahead and plug in f the k over x, uh, k over n, uh, that is going to give me uh, k over n to the k, and it's going to give me uh, n minus k over n to the n minus k, All right? So that's the maximum. Okay, so this is just calculus one, uh, rearing his head up in here, um, and a little bit of pre-calculus, so not too bad. Okay, uh, now let's take a look at uh, part three. So uh, the third question uh, gives us this guy. So it tells us that b and k of x is equal to n choose k times x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k. 
And uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to prove that uh, b n comma k of x is equal to uh, x times b n minus one k minus one of x uh, plus one minus x times b n minus one comma k of x. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's not too bad. Um, so let's just take a look at what each of these quantities are. B n minus one comma k minus one of x uh, is equal to n minus one k minus one uh, times x to the k times one minus x to the n minus k, and we have uh, B n minus one comma k of x is equal to uh, n minus one choose k of x to the k times uh, one minus x to the n minus one minus k. Oh, and that should have been uh, k minus one up here. And uh, yeah, so that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and see if we can do it. Uh, so I can start from this side and work that way if I would like. So uh, let's take a look and see what x times b n minus one and my k n k minus one of x is, uh, plus one minus x times b n minus one comma k of x. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and do it. So on, so that first term, uh, we're multiplying, so we have n minus one, k minus one, and now we multiply by x, so we get x to the k, then we have one minus x to the n minus k. And then on the next one, uh, we multiply through by one minus x. And so we get n minus one choose k of x to the k times one minus x to the n minus k, right? So now these two terms match. So I can go ahead and combine their coefficients. So we get n minus one choose k minus one plus n minus one choose k of uh, x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k. Now what we're left with is showing uh, that this is n choose k. Uh, now, if you're familiar with how these uh, binomial coefficients work, uh, that that's it, we were done. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and take a look uh, and just expand these out into their definitions and so it makes it a little bit more obvious. So we have that n minus 1 factorial divided by I uh, say k minus one factorial times n minus uh, k minus one factorial. Uh, and now we're gonna take a look at adding uh, n minus one factorial divided by uh, k factorial times n minus one minus k factorial. Oh, I should have had This should have been n minus one minus k minus one, so that should be n minus k factorial. Okay, so we want to show that this is equal to uh, n choose k. Um, so uh, what we can see is that uh, each of these are missing a term. So here uh, we're missing a k, and over here uh, we're missing an n minus k. And so if I uh, find common denominators, then I end up having k times n minus one factorial uh, plus n minus k times n minus one factorial divided by um, k factorial times n minus k factorial. And now I can factor out an n minus one factorial at the top and add up k plus n minus k, and that gives me n times n minus one factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial and that gives me n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial and that is just n choose k right so straightforward okay cool so uh thus uh this guy is equal to b n k right so uh so we're done all right, 
Uh, so what is the next one? Uh, two. I want to prove that uh, this that we have this relation. Uh, d by dx of b and k of x uh, is equal to n times b n minus one times k minus one times x uh, minus b n minus one comma k of x. Right. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, so if I take the derivative of n choose k of x to the k times uh, 1 minus x to the n minus k, uh, then what do I get? Uh, well, I'm going to have, let's see, uh, do, 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 n choose k times k times x to the k minus 1 times 1 minus x to the n minus k uh, minus, don't forget that chain rule this time, uh, n minus k times x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k minus 1. Okay, so if I do that, uh, then I can multiply through by n choose k. Now I'm just going to multiply it through by n factorial divided by n divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial times k and now this times x to the k minus 1 times 1 minus x to the n minus k minus n factorial divided by uh, k factorial times n minus k factorial times n minus k i uh, times x to the k 1 minus x to the n minus k minus 1. Okay, so uh, it's clear where that's going to cancel here. And so uh, that leaves us with n factorial divided by k minus 1 factorial times n minus k factorial times x to the k minus 1, 1 minus x to the n minus k minus n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k minus 1 factorial times n minus k uh, times x to the k. Oh, sorry, we just canceled that one term. Uh, times x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k minus 1. Okay, uh, so uh, this quantity here is just going to be n times n minus 1 choose k minus 1. And this term here is n times n minus 1 choose uh, k. Uh, so if I multiply n times this, uh, then everything else is going to be left with x to the k minus 1 times 1 minus x to the n minus k and minus uh, x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k minus 1. And that is exactly that. So, uh, yeah, let's put a pretty equal sign somewhere. And there we go. Uh, so that is, uh, that is that. All right. Uh, the third property, um, that is, uh, number three. Um, oh, sorry. Three, times three. I want to prove that. integral from 0 to 1 of bn choose bn k of x dx is equal to 1 over n plus 1. Um, yeah, it's put in there we can use induction and integration by parts. Uh, or, sorry, uh, part 1 and induction. And yeah, yeah, that's something we could try to do. Alright, so I... Uh, so let's see. I'm going to go ahead and verify it for, say, uh, b. Uh, uh, I think one zero i of x, and what is that going to give me? Well, I for b one zero, uh, we're going to have one choose zero of x to the zero times one minus x to the one, and I uh, 
And so this is going to be just 1 minus x. And the integral from 0 to 1 of, of 1 over x of 1 minus x dx is actually equal to 1 half. It's just triangle, right? With height and width 1. All right, so there you go. I uh, and if I take a look at say uh, b one comma one of x, then this is going to be one choose one times x to the one times one minus x to the zero, and so that is just equal to x. And again, uh, the integral from zero to one of x dx is equal to one half. Uh, it's a triangle going the other way. Okay, good. So good. Uh, one half is equal to one over one plus one, and so there we go. Now, let's take a look at uh, our induction. So uh, assume that uh, this holds for uh, n bigger than or equal to 1 and uh, k between, say, 0 and n. Now we want to show it works for n plus 1. So I uh, take a look. Now we're going to consider the integral from say zero to one of b n plus one comma k of x dx. And now that first identity tells us as this is the same as the integral from zero to one of I uh, see. Let me double check. Uh, x times b n minus one comma k. <sighs> minus 1 x uh, plus 1 minus x times b n minus 1 comma k x. dx okay uh let's see does that actually help i claimed it it did so i, I better um So the only thing to do would be to try integration by parts. So uh, hands giving out here. So let's go ahead and copy this bit over. And let's take a look. So the integral from zero to one of x times b n minus one k minus one of x dx to set u is equal to x and I get du is equal to dx and if I set um, dv is equal to uh, bn minus 1 k minus 1 of x dx uh, then v I'm just going to write as the integral from 0 to x of uh, bn minus 1 k minus 1 at t dt Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, so uh, the integral here then is going to be, uh, so we get u, which is x times uh, integral from 0 to x of b n minus 1 k minus 1 t dt. And we need to evaluate this at x equals 0 and x equals 1 because we have bounds uh, minus uh, the integral uh, from 0 to 1 of v du, uh, and that is going to be integral from 0 to x of bn minus 1, k minus 1, t dt, dx. Okay. All right. So, so the end note is that at 0, this is 0, and so that's going to disappear. And at 1, this is 1. And this, by induction, is 1 over n. So uh, so this whole quantity here is going to be 1 over n plus, uh, rather, uh, yeah, 1 over n. Uh, and now we have minus the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 0 to x of bn minus 1, now k minus 1, t dt dx. OK. Now. Uh, we do the same on the other guy. Uh, let's see. So what do we get? 
is this. Uh, whew, um, let's change to purple. And so we have the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus x times b n minus 1 k of x dx. And here I'm going to set u is equal to 1 minus x. And so that gives me du is equal to minus dx. And I'm going to set uh, this guy, b n minus 1 comma k of x uh, dx is equal to my v. And so that means uh, my dv. And so that means that v is equal to the integral from say 0 to x of b n minus 1 comma k of t dt. Okay, so uh, now we have u, which is 1 minus x times the integral from 0 to x of b n minus 1 comma k of t dt. Evaluate at x equals 0 and x equals 1. Um, yep. uh, minus the integral uh, from 0 to 1 of v du. Now du was minus dx, so I put a minus sign there. And we get the integral from 0 to x of b n minus 1 comma k of t dt. Now, at x equals 0, this is 0. And at x equals 1, this is 0. So overall, I get uh, just this integral, 0 to 1 of the integral from 0 to x of b n minus 1 k times t dt. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at what we have all together. We have that this guy uh, is equal to uh, this quantity, or rather this quantity plus this quantity. So uh, let's put that together. So we have the integral from say zero to one of b and k of x dx is equal to one over n times uh, the integral from zero to one times the integral from zero to x of b n minus one k minus one of t uh, Move this guy. This guy needs to move over because I had a minus sign. And the other guy was b n minus 1, comma k times d. Right? dt dx. Okay, so. Boom, boom, boom. Putting things together, staying a little organized. Let's see. Okay, so uh, now if we take a look at uh, the other uh, problem uh, where we saw. Uh, oh, did I screw up something? I think I did. Uh, not a big deal, but this should be equal to n, and this should be equal to. There we go. Uh, just because I was going from n plus 1 down, and it needs to go just by one term. So sorry. Uh, so all those terms should just be n. This should be n. Uh, this should be n. And so this should be n. 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 I apologize. n. n. And this should be n plus 1. Again. And, and there we go. A um, couple more. There we go. Okay. I think I got them all. And I guess uh, sounds so good. Take a look. Uh, so in here should be n and n. Doop, doop. <sighs> and this was 1 over n plus all that. Okay. So we're almost there. So uh, what do we have? 
So if you take a look uh, back at the uh, part two, uh, we had this identity. We had uh, bn comma k of t minus bn comma k minus one of t. Uh, this guy, if I multiplied it times n, this was d by dx of bn k, right? Or d by dt in this case. Pretty sure. Uh, And, okay, so it's minus that. Oops. Just looking at the paper and trying to, to get that. Everything lined up. Yeah, and again, that should be n plus 1, and that should be n plus 1. Okay, so uh, with all these indices figured out, uh, oops, of t. Okay. So, uh, so then what does that give us? So that gives us the integral from zero to one of b n plus one comma k of x dx is equal to one over n plus the integral from zero to one of the integral from zero to x of uh, minus, uh, minus d by dt or b n plus one comma k of t dt dx and uh and if we want it we need to multiply and divide by n as well so it's going to be yeah so one over n comes out of here okay good uh so uh, this is good so we get one over n plus one over n times the integral from zero to one uh of this guy um so this is going to be uh minus bn plus one comma k uh, at x uh, plus bn plus one comma k at zero uh, dx but we know that this is just zero at zero and so uh, now we have this integral on the left hand side and we have this integral on the right hand side and so i can move that over and so then we get uh, one plus one over n of integral from zero to one of b n plus one comma k t parentheses here is equal to one over n and so uh, now i can divide uh, by this term which is n plus one over n and so then that tells us that we get integral from zero to one of b n plus one comma k of t is equal to uh, dt is equal to one over n plus one right and so done and so uh, thus we have shown uh, thus we have shown that uh, it holds for n uh, plus one and all k less or equal to n plus one less or equal to one uh, zero. I uh, see. Well, actually, I guess we do have one one more bit to do. So we've shown that much. And we have to show it works for a k uh, corresponding to uh, n plus one. And so for uh, b n plus one comma k plus one uh, n plus one here, uh, this is actually just going to be uh, uh, n plus one. Choose n plus one times x to the n plus one and we know that uh did i screw up things sorry this should have had n plus one on it <sighs> which means that this should have had n plus one on it which would then give us n plus two here. And I forgot to carry over the, oh my goodness. All right, you get the idea, but, uh, but yeah. They should have all had n plus ones on it. 
Okay, now that's all clear. Okay, now I, this guy, integral that. I, well, don't even need to get there yet. Um, this should be, this is gonna be x to the n plus one. And so then uh, the integral from zero to one of x to the n plus one dx is equal to one over n plus two. All right, and so then that's done. All right, so now we've shown everything we need to show. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna take a break because my kids are home and it's gonna get noisy. And uh, and yeah, uh, mostly there. Uh, all we have left is problem four. Um, that only takes a moment of thought and then we have to get back to problem one. Okay, so uh, after taking a brief break and um, resting my hand, I, I can come back and talk to this. So there's something another way we can approach this problem, by the way, um, and it's worth mentioning because it also resolves the issue. Uh, it's a little bit less convoluted, um, and so we can go ahead and talk about it here. So we take a look at the integral from, say, uh, 0, 1 of b and k of x dx. Uh, this can also be written as integral from 0 to 1 of n choose k times x to the k 1 minus x to the n minus k. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, use integration by parts. So I say u is equal to x to the k, and that's going to be du is equal to k times x to the k minus 1 dx. And, uh, and then that's what it's going to leave me is dv is equal to 1 minus x to n minus k, which is going to be uh, 1 over n minus k plus 1 times uh, 1 minus x to the n minus k plus 1, and then a minus sign coming out of that. And so when I evaluate integration by parts, I get x to the k, and I get, uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and pull out the n choose k, by the way. Um, but then what it's going to leave me with is uh, you have x to the k from u, uh, v is going to leave us uh, n minus k plus one time, and then it's gonna give us a one minus x to the n minus k uh, plus one. Uh, and this is gonna be evaluated at zero and x equals one. And then we're gonna have plus, because the minus sign on the on the v, which should still also be there, uh, times the integral from zero to one of uh, one of v du. So it's gonna be, uh, so it's going to give us a k from the du, and it's going to give us a n uh, minus, I'm going to put it k minus 1 here in parentheses. Uh, and it's going to leave us with x to the to k minus 1 times uh, 1 minus x to the n minus k plus 1 dx. So what did we do? We, we moved one exponent off of this guy and we put it on this guy. And um, and then if we take a look here uh, with this, uh, what do we end up getting? Well, we end up having uh, this is n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus uh, k factorial. And, uh, and then we're multiplying this times uh, k divided by uh, n minus k minus 1, right? And uh, so we see a k is going to end up being killed here, and then we're going to end up uh, having um, this n minus k minus 1 killing uh, the term that's just underneath here. Um, and so what's ultimately going to be left over here is going to be uh, just the n. And, um, and yeah, and, and then we have, sorry, uh, yeah, I don't know why I just said that part, but yeah, anyway, so, so then basically the idea is that each time we do this, we're going to be eliminating uh, one of these guys. We're going to be accumulating some terms over here, and then, um, we'll see what ends up canceling on that side. Uh, but then what you're left with is integral from zero to one. Uh, of x to the k minus 1 times 1 minus x to the n minus k plus 1 dx uh, because this term when you evaluate it at 0 1 goes away uh, this is assuming that k is not equal to um, 0 and we're assuming that k is not equal to n 
if k was zero then we can just go ahead and integrate and if k was equal to n we can still just go ahead and integrate it and there wouldn't be any issue so i uh, so yeah so then the idea is that we want to continue this and so um so we go ahead and we integrate again and uh and that whole process is going to give you this uh well, we'll just keep um let's keep that over here and choose k just save my hand and uh and so then the next term is going to be k minus one divided by n minus k minus one times n minus k minus two and this is then going to become integral from zero to one of x to the k minus two times one minus x to the n minus k plus two dx okay and so you can see how the pattern is going uh going to work out here um ultimately we end up getting n choose k and then i uh, then all of these terms are going to be k times k minus one all the way down until we get to uh, one so it's going to be just k factorial on the top and this one is going to be um sorry if you hear my children uh having a good time ah, it's so hard for me to concentrate with this there uh so and then we continue on with the other one and it gives me n minus k minus one factorial on the bottom here times the integral from zero to one and uh and we worked all that down it becomes one minus x to the n minus uh well just actually to the well let's say n minus k plus k right dx and so all this goes away and uh then what we're left with is this we get n choose k times k factorial over n minus k minus one factorial times uh, 1 minus x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 and that is time evaluated at 0 1 okay uh, and uh, minus sign should pop out of here All right and so we integrate that and that's going to give us n choose k gives us k factorial divided by n minus k minus 1 factorial times 1 over n plus 1. So now we need to figure out what this is. Okay, uh, so the idea is that this should be able to annihilate uh, whatever's left over here. Um, and so let's go ahead and take a look. So we have n choose k. Now we have k factorial divided by n minus k minus 1 factorial. Um, and this is equal to n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial times k factorial divided by k factorial times n minus uh, k factorial divided by n minus k minus 1 factorial. All right, so this obviously cancels this. Uh, and um, let's see, n minus k cancels uh, a lot out of n factorial. Um, let's see if we can get n factorial out of this guy. Hmm. I'm sorry. I uh, this term isn't actually uh, what I was thinking. It's actually ascending, right? So it's n minus k plus one times n minus k plus two, etc. And so here, instead of writing this, we'll write n minus k minus. Uh, so this becomes uh, n minus k plus 1, uh, n minus k plus 2, all the way up to n minus k plus k. Ah, silly mistake. 
uh, which is just n. Okay, uh, and this term, uh, so it's going to be, uh, basically we can rewrite this as n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down until we get to n minus k plus 1. Okay, good. Sorry about that. That's uh, what happens when you try to do all this stuff off the cuff, like straight from the top of your head. Anyway, uh, so yeah. So then that's not what that is there. Um, and, and here we get n times n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way down to n minus k plus 1. Okay, so I now uh, what now we can actually combine everything. Uh, so we see that uh, this is almost n factorial. I uh, if I multiply by I uh, n minus k times n minus k minus one descending down into one, then we get n factorial. Uh, but that's exactly this term here. So this term times this term is n factorial. So this is one. Thus, we have the integral from zero to one of b n comma k of x dx is equal to one over n plus one, right? Because we just showed that this term here is one. Okay, cool. So a lot simpler. Uh, maybe a lot less slick, um, depending on, on who you are. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, there's multiple ways to skin the cat. And if you can do it that way, just find me on the exam. Okay, uh, so uh, now let's take a look at problem number one. Uh, we want to prove that um, we have the sum of k equals 0 to n. Uh, n choose k k squared over n squared times 1 minus x to the n minus k times x to the k is equal to n minus 1 over n x squared plus 1 over n x. Now this is a um, uh, this falls out much like what we saw with um, the uh, the term where we had only uh, k over n here and so it was part of the Bernstein polynomial uh, proof that we had and um, yeah this one actually isn't that all that bad to, to prove um, now remember I uh, that you know we have um, x plus 1 minus x uh, to the n is what gave us this form, right? k equals 0 to n of n choose k of uh, x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k, right? Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace x at, by p and 1 minus x by q so we can get more identities. So p plus q to the n is equal to the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k times p to the k, q to the n minus k. All right, so what we did last time, uh, we saw this sort of thing, is we took their respect to p. Now this is uh, the sort of thing I would expect you to be able to do an exam, is just it's like the first step here. Uh, so if I take the derivative with respect to p here, uh, then what we get is this. We get n times p plus q to the n minus one. It's equal to sum k equals zero to n of n choose k times k times p to the k minus one q to the n minus k. Now, we, if I, I go ahead and multiply both sides by p, then I get n times p times p plus q to the n minus 1 uh, is equal to the sum n, uh, k equals 0 to n of n choose k times k times x to the k uh, x to the k time, oh sorry, get ahead of myself p to the k times q to the n minus k. And then by plugging in uh, p equals x and q is equal to 1 minus x, uh, this term becomes 1. And so we get nx is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n of nk times k times p, uh, x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k. Right, uh, and if we divide by n, we get that first identity we had from the lecture. Right, not too bad. All right, so now if we want to get the, uh, but we'd like a k squared here. 
And so if we want to go and take a step further, we need to go ahead and, and do that. Um, so if I take second derivative, uh, it's going to give me this. It's going to be n times n minus 1 times p plus q, let's say n minus 2, is equal to the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k times k, uh, well, k times k minus 1, which is k squared minus 1, k, times p to the k minus 2, q to the n minus k. Now, I'd like to get this to just be k, so I'm going to multiply by p squared. So that's going to give me n times n minus 1 times p squared times p plus q to the n minus 2 is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n of n choose k, k squared minus k times p to the k, q to the n minus k. And again, if we go ahead and we plug in um, say x and 1 minus x, we get n times n minus 1 times x squared. And now p plus q is just 1, so that next term is just 1, is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n of n choose k times k squared minus k, where we get, and now we have x to the k, and then we have 1 minus x to the n minus k. Okay. So I can continue to expand this, and this is the sum of k equals 0 to n of n choose k, k squared times x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k, and I'm splitting off this other term. But if I split off this other term with a minus k, uh, that is just this term, right? So I can just put n, nx here. So now I move nx to the other side. And so I get n times n minus 1 times x squared plus nx is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n of n choose k times k, uh, times k squared times x to the k, 1 minus x to the n minus k, and then uh, divide by n squared. And, uh, and what do we get? Uh, we get n times n minus 1, or, well, let's say n minus 1 divided by n times x squared plus x over n is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n, n choose k, of k squared over n squared of x to the k, 1 minus x to the n minus k. And there we go. Uh, that's it. Uh, that is the, um, the proof of the formula. Now, uh, if you can get down to where you have this and divide by n and that gives you the first identity, that's something I'd expect you to be able to do handily. Um, but yeah, uh, this extra spot stuff is good to know how to do. And you can do this for k. Uh, k cubed, k to the fourth, k to the fifth, etc. Uh, all right, last thing, uh, and so this is problem number four. I uh, they say from problem three, I uh, deduce uh, this that we have the integral from zero to one of b n x uh, f dx. Uh, uh, basically converges to the integral. From 0 to 1 of f of x dx. All right now, what we know when we have the Bernstein polynomial is basically the sum of k equals 0 to n of n choose k of uh, f of k over n times uh, b. Uh, sorry, x to the k times 1 minus x to the n minus k dx. And this and this is basically b n k, right? So uh, this is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n of f of k over n times 1 over n plus 1. Okay. So uh, let's take a look and see what we have. Uh, so if I were to go ahead and draw this out on an interval, and so we have 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n, uh, or well, 
this is one over n, well, two over n, three over n, up to uh, n over n. Uh, basically, that's what we're going to have. These are my points of f, right? That we're sampling. And, uh, and so f is doing something like this. Now, the terms uh, i over n are going to be the left hand side of, uh, you know, of this. And so basically, we're doing a left hand rule integration almost, I, uh, you know, of f. And so um, basically, I. If I had an n here and I shaved off one of the terms, so I basically would get this. I get the sum k equals zero to say n minus one of f of k over n. I, I'm gonna, and basically if I pull out the one over n plus one here and I'm gonna shave off, I shaved off f of one divided by n plus one. Now, if I multiply and divide by n here, uh, then what do we get? We get 1 over n plus 1 times n sum k equals 0 to n minus 1 of f of k over n times 1 over n uh, plus f of 1 over n plus 1. Now, as n goes to infinity, uh, we have that the sum of k equals 0 to n minus 1 of f of k over n times 1 over n converges to the integral of 0 to 1 of f of x dx. This is the left-hand rule. And um, we have that n over n plus 1 converges to 1. And we have that f of 1 over n plus 1 converges to 0. And so uh, thus, therefore, uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to 1 of bn of f of x dx uh, is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. And there we go. Uh, that's that's a proof. So not too bad. All right, so uh, that's everything but like one problem out of section two, and this is taking me like two and a half hours, and I'm getting messages all over the place because uh, I think it's time for lunch. And um, yeah, I'm going to stop here. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, tuning in. I hope you feel better about the exam. OK, so I hope that cleared up any lingering homework questions, uh, any questions that you might have that are related to the exam. And um, and yeah, we're, we'll just stop there. Um, uh, so at this point, I've shown you how to do everything. Uh, there's nothing that's going to be on the exam that hasn't been in a lecture or hasn't been given here. Um, half of the class, it all comes down to homework. And I gave it to you over a month ago so you guys can get some practice with it and get familiar with it and ask me questions about it. Uh, it's always telling that I could never get uh, questions about uh, homework until like maybe a week beforehand, maybe two weeks beforehand. And, um, and yeah, it's this is all, um, yeah, but... You know, I'm happy to help you guys and you know even if you have last minute questions please do uh, uh, ping me with them uh, I'm happy to respond to pestering um, this is uh, my job is to uh, reply to you and, uh, and keep you apprised of what's going on so if you are nervous about anything anything you don't understand uh, let me know and uh, and I'll get back with you all right anyway so I'm gonna stop here and um, yeah uh, have a good day and good luck